welcome to the Chesterland Community Church. We are glad you are here this morning. Let us join together in singing all creatures of our God and King. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou moon and sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise God, oh, praise God. so strong the clouds that sail in heaven along oh praise God alleluia thou rising morning praise rejoice ye lights of evening find a voice oh praise God oh praise God Christ in humbleness. Oh, praise God. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Alleluia. Alleluia. in the call to worship. Oh Lord, my, my, Lord, Lord, my, Lord, my, Lord, my Lord. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Oh, oh Lord, Lord, my Lord, rock Lord, and my Lord, redeemer. Lord. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. Oh Lord, oh, Lord. Lord. My rock, rock and my, my redeemer. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the earth. O Lord, my oh, rock, rock and my redeemer. God, we are so grateful that you call us together in this holy moment. We welcome your presence once again and always. Thank you for the beauty of this day. It warms our hearts. We call upon the ancestors to be with us as together we pray and praise. Amen. As we feel the pace quicken and the time draw near, we are filled with the joy as we move towards this Easter time and the promise of reconciliation with you. Teach us to follow the example that your son has set to be worthy of being called his people. 
Help us to live each day as he did. Turn hatred into love and conflict into peace. Grant us this time of waiting and healing for all whom we have mentioned here today and that are on our hearts. As we await the new life with eagerness, faith, and with gratitude. Join me in this variation upon the Lord's Prayer. It was taken from the prayer book from the Big Bible Storybook. Praise you, God. You are very great in every way. Please give us the things we need today. For you will give us what we need. We are sorry that we do wrong things and disobey. For you forgive us when we say we are too sorry. God, help us in everything we do. Please help us live for you to all listen when we talk. For you will always listen when we talk. Help us to listen listen when you talk. Amen. I want us all to picture ourselves for a moment where you may not know where lunch is going to come from. You don't have food in your refrigerator. You don't have money in your bank account. And there's no fast food restaurant around. And even if there was, on your trip there, you have a fear of some sort of protest or abduction, some sort of political unrest. So then you think, oh, I'll just grow my own food. But now you're dealing with climate change that's impacting your crops at every moment. Now imagine all of that happening in one moment. This is the reality of a lot of families in this country. They're dealing with their inability to keep their crops from growing enough to keep all of their families fed day to day. Families are finding it harder and harder to find what's called food security, which means feeling secure and knowing where your food is coming from. And they don't even think that it's an attainable goal at this point uh, because of climate change. Because if it rains too much, the crops die from disease. And if it doesn't rain enough, everything dries up. So either way, they're losing. Rene Bermudez, He is one of the farmers in the community uh, who is working to try to figure out this uh, harvest situation to figure out how to feed his family. In fact, he's raising stingless bees called melipona bees, which produce medicinal honey so that he can sell that and not have to necessarily rely on just his crops. And through programs like One Great Hour of Sharing, he was able to learn about poultry raising and started raising chickens. And now he has 40 hens that produce eggs and another 140 that he is preparing to sell. So I invite you to think about these stories and join me in the one great hour of sharing. Thank you, Megan. And as we consider what we can give and after hearing those stories, how blessed we are, what we have, that we are able to give back just a portion of what we've been given. Let us pray. God of abundant mercy, give us the courage to ask humbly for forgiveness when we have failed. And grant it where we have been wrong, continue to heal us and make the whole world whole again by what we have given. And we ask that we might find joy in the life that we fully have. Amen.
Because it is a communion Sunday, I've decided to take this opportunity to talk about Eucharist so that we can have a better understanding of what this is and why we do it and a little bit of the history maybe. I want to give some uh, credit to blogger Lenora Rand who raised the questions that I'm going to be exploring and Kurt Struckmeyer, a theologian and author who ventured to address them carefully and with deep meaning. And you'll see that there's a lot of history involved. So this morning I'm beginning with some third century before Christ geography. And I'm going to share a legend. And then I'm going to do a little bit of digging into the earliest writings of the New Testament to see how all this comes together in some theological reflection regarding the practice of sharing the sacred meal, which today we call communion or holy communion or the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to be sharing about the Gauls, G-A-U-L-S. They're tribes of people that lived and existed during the Iron Age, before the time of Jesus. Have you ever heard of them? Meg is uh, posting a an aerial view for us to see the land that the Gauls occupied. You can see it was an extensive area. But of course, these boundaries changed as they battled and conquered lands across the continent. They were a formidable bunch of people, large people, and their men and their women alike were formidable and great warriors. So there's a legend that goes like this. When the Gauls had invaded the eternal city of Rome, Rome was at at its knee. And when they reached the capital, it's, it's, it's called Capitoline Hill. Remember, Rome is on seven hills. And if you look right in the center of this diagram, that's the Capitoline Hill. I have a, a light mark around it. And that's where they were headed. They were going there to try to seize it at night. And when they approached the temple dedicated to Juno, there was a sacred flock of geese that woke up and their honking alerted the Roman guards. The Roman army turned back the invaders and the geese went down in history as saving Rome. St. Isidore of Seville recounts this in some of his writings, the virtues of these geese. The geese were named in a similar way to the ducks because their names were similar and they were both waterfowl. But these geese were like watchdogs at night and they would give warning with their honking and their noise. And I have two sources that can can conflict with one another. One said that they can smell humans better than any other animal. And another one said their sense of smell is not as good as dogs. So whatever, they do have a sense of smell where they can pick up humans' presence. And so these geese warned Rome of the attack by the Gauls. And interestingly, the ancient Celtic people saw the Holy Spirit not as a hovering white dove the way we think of the the Holy Spirit, but as a wild goose. And the meaning behind this peculiar choice is because they saw how the Holy Spirit has a tendency to disrupt and surprise. And the Holy Spirit moves in our lives in an unexpected fashion, similar to the actions of wild geese. Now, a few years ago, I was visiting in some of this Celtic land that we just saw on the map. And I was in Iona, which is an island of Scotland, which is a Celtic area. And while I was there, I purchased the shirt that I have on. And I wondered why, where it says Iona community, why do they have a picture of a goose? And I never knew until this research, why? That's their symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
So this reality is frequently reflected in our lives, the way the Holy Spirit works, and in the lives of those who have gone before us. And I'm sure most of you have heard this saying, you make plans and God laughs. Uh Uh-huh. I know I understand that in my life many times, but have you... Have you or someone that you've known made plans well and had them well in place? I mean, all about following what you felt was your call, and but then you were prevented or you were sideswiped and you were led in an unexpected way that you never would have dreamt. Well, St. Francis of Assisi, that's the saint who's attributed to, you know, all of the, the, the um, relationship with animals and creation. And he's a perfect example. He was a man who heard the voice of God and the voice of God said to him, rebuild my church. And so he took God's voice literally. And he went to the countryside where there was this old church that was falling down San Damiano. And he thought that God wanted him to rebuild this old church. And so he went and gathered stones and bricks and mortar. And one by one, he was putting them in place. However, the Holy Spirit surprised him as other young men in the village came to help him in this work. And what you're seeing right now is this is the geese that now are in stained glass windows because they are symbols of the Holy Spirit. That's what that image is. So here's Francis building this old church, rebuilding it. And the young men in the village come and they want to help him. And so he lets them help. But he he is really sideswiped by the Holy Spirit because now is when God is letting him know what he really meant when he said, Francis, I want you to rebuild my church. Because unbeknownst to Francis, as these young men gathered with him, it was the beginning of a spiritual community that we now know today as the Franciscans, the Franciscan friars and monks. And for those of you who know Father Richard Rohr and the Pope, (laughs) well, no, the Pope was a Jesuit, sorry, he was a Jesuit. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan. But Franciscans um, are beautiful souls who really do their best to take care of the environment based on the teachings of St. Francis. And that's what, what the message was from God to rebuild the church to do this. And then the other thing that Francis did, he had a dear friend, childhood friend, who was name was Claire. And she wanted to join the guys. And he knew that wasn't going to work. So he helped her start a community of women of nuns called the poor Claire's. And they're still with us today, just like the Franciscans. So all of this happened because God whispered to Francis, rebuild my church. And then the Holy Spirit helps him understand what he was supposed to be doing. So the next time you set out on a wild goose chase, it might not be you who's chasing the goose, but the goose who's chasing you. Now I gave you all of that background so that we can appreciate this first blog from our blogger, Lenora Rand. She reflects on her experience distributing communion at the Wild Goose Festival, which is an annual gathering that focuses on justice, spirituality, music, and the arts. The festival is rooted in Christian tradition and is popular among progressive Christians and many involved with the emerging church movement. The name Wild Goose comes from this Celtic metaphor for the Holy Spirit. And now you have the background to understand that. Rand says, I was suddenly so uncomfortable with the words I have always known to say during communion. As they were coming out of my mouth, my head was swirling with questions about whether these particular words adequately reflected my beliefs anymore. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. I started thinking about it afterwards, though, wondering, what do I really believe about atonement? What do I believe about this sacrament? What else could I say with conviction during communion? 
So Rand is raising issues of how this ancient practice of the Eucharist, and by the way, the word Eucharist comes from a Greek word, Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. It's the great thanksgiving. And she's asking questions about how the Eucharist is being impacted by the postmodern world in which many of the traditional doctrines of all the churches are being questioned and reevaluated. When looking at a question of theology and church practice, I always think the best thing is first to go back to our roots, go back to the scripture, go back to the biblical texts. It's the living word of God. So how is it supporting us today? And it is at the root of the discussion. So let's look at Paul and what the gospel writers have to say about Eucharist. Now this chart starts with Jesus's crucifixion in the year, about the year 33 CE, which means the common era, which means after Christ. And then Paul, you see he's there around 54 common era about 20 years after Jesus's death. And I don't know, some people don't realize this, but even though Paul is called an apostle of Jesus, he never met Jesus in the flesh. He met him in spirit, but he never met him. He was not one of the 12 apostles and he lived after Jesus, they never met. But he has the earliest writing in the New Testament. He wrote his first letter to the community of Corinth in Greece around the year 54 CE. He shared the Eucharistic tradition that he had learned from members of a Hellenistic Christ cult in Damascus, Syria. Now in this, he's going to speak as if he knows Jesus, but we all know historically he did not. He says, and this is found in Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Now in some of the earlier translations, the word broken is not in there. It reads, this is my body that is for you. So we can think of it in either way. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after cup, after, after supper, saying, you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's the end of the Corinthian chapter, the Corinthian verse. Now this is familiar language from our communion liturgy. Now the earliest gospel is the gospel of Mark. Mark's account was written about 70 common era, about 16 years after Paul's letter. And here's what Mark says in the first gospel that was written. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Now it's important to note, there's one word that isn't in all of the original writings and that is new covenant, the word new is not present in some of the early writings. Well, now if we keep tracing this historically, going down our chart there, we see that Matthew and Luke also wrote gospels around the same time between 85 and 90 common era. So it's another 15 to 20 years after Mark. You see how we're getting further and further away from the time of Jesus. And here's what theirs say, first from Matthew. And I just notice the similarities and if you can pick up the differences. Matthew, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup 
And after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's the first time you hear that. Mm -hmm. Next quote is taken from Luke. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now the three that, uh, I'm not talking about Paul, I'm talking about the three gospels now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you notice, those accounts are all very similar. A little bit of difference here and there, but very similar. These three gospels are called the synoptic gospels. Let's take a look at that word, synoptic. Syn means similar, like synonym, syn. Optic means what we can see. We can see the similarities. They look the same. Synoptic gospels, they're like parallel gospels. You can line them up and see similarities when you line them up next to each other. Now, John's gospel, the fourth gospel, was written around 100 CE common era. And he doesn't even portray the Last Supper. John's gospel is not a synoptic gospel. His gospel is very different from the other three. Let me share with you what he does say, although he does not talk about the Last Supper. John's, when he talks about Jesus's comments on the practice of eating his body and blood, here's what he says. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And you can see how different that is. And the Jews, they disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Now that's how John presents these teachings of Jesus that we see in the Synoptic Gospels, but he does it very differently in his Gospel. Now, I want to point this out because I think it is important. Our translations make a difference, and often the translations reflect the theological viewpoints of the translator. It's just normal. Any one of us, we have our opinions. We bring our, our life experience to whatever we're doing. And anything that we read, anything that we talk about is always going to be infiltrated through our own filtering system. We're going to see and understand things. So in the, what I just read for you, where it talks about we'll live forever, where it talks, or it says, it doesn't mean eternal the way we use the word. In the Greek text, what it means is it will live into this new age. So he's talking about the kingdom of God is expressed on earth, not eternal life in heaven, and remember, this is all helping us now to redefine. I'm bringing this up because 
all of us. This is part of what's happening to our ways of understanding. As science, as we've learned things, as we know now that there's trillions of galaxies out there, and as far as we know, we haven't discovered heaven. No, because it's probably not there. It's probably right here. And so if we read this text in this new way, with this new way of understanding science, we can understand that what's eternal is will be right here. That it has to do with the way our consciousness will move forward. And there's so many things. I'm not pretending to understand this. I'm not pretending to tell you that this is the way it is. I'm just telling you some of the things that people are saying these days, which is maybe heaven has to do with how we change the way we think and how we become more connected to divinity and to ancient love and how that transforms who we are so that someday, and we're already getting tastes of it, we will know that heaven is right here. So I'll leave that with you to, to, to ponder. So now there's these historical questions and disputes around the Eucharist and these metaphors, like I'm just talking about, spread of life, my body, my blood, they're all physical realities. So is this a memorial feast? Do this in remembrance of me, according to what Paul said? Or is Christ actually present in the bread and wine? Some, spirit, some religious groups believe that. It's called the divine presence and communion. Some people believe in transubstantiation. That's all one word. I separated it out so you can see what it means. Trans means to be able to go across. The substance, the actual essence of a thing. So what that means is if you believe in transubstantiation when we celebrate communion, that means that you believe that the actual bread becomes the actual, the trans substance, the body of Christ. It's not just a symbol. It's actually the body of Christ. And the cup becomes the blood of Christ. So that's what transubstantiation means. And that's what most Catholics believe. Then we have trans signification. And that's what most Protestant churches believe. Trans the symbols cross and we have, it's, it signifies, so the bread and the, and the cup signify or symbolize the body and blood of Christ. And then we have what some people believe, and I think it's Lutherans that might believe this, but I'm not positive, consubstantiation, con meaning with substance. So somehow the bread and the wine have the substance with them even though they're not totally changed, have the substance of Christ's body and blood with them, supporting them, but not an actual change of the reality of the substance. So these are three different views. So what does the Eucharist mean today in this postmodern setting? And how should we practice its celebration for inclusivity? So this is what Lenora Rand was struggling with the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And in the Lutheran liturgy that she used, it was the words were the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Are these words of distribution the most theologically sound and the most appropriate for us today? Well, it, now it depends. Isn't it something, nothing's ever easy, never, never uncomplicated. Humans have a way of complicating everything. So how do we practice the Eucharist? Depends on which gospel message we're responding to and basing our faith on. And the two I'm going to look at, and I'm using the word gospel in, a, in the liberal sense of the good news. We know that Paul did not write a gospel that we have in our, um, in our scriptures. No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four gospel evangelists. But Paul did significant writing. He was the first writer and he wrote all of the letters and epistles and the Acts of the Apostles is attributed to him. So we're calling his work a gospel, the good news, according to Paul. But first, let's look at Jesus. The gospel of Jesus proclaims the good news that the kingdom of God is breaking into our world. That's what I was just talking about. Is breaking into our 
our world and is now present among us. It is a social gospel that announces good news to the poor. We just had a passing of a relief bill through the Senate announcing good news to the poor, the suffering, the marginalized, the oppressed. So this is the way to understand the gospel of Jesus. Now let's look at the gospel of Paul. What do his writings tell us? Well, in the gospel of Paul, proclaims a very different good news. Again, coming through a whole different set of filters. And this good news is sacrificial. Atoning death of Jesus fundamentally changes everything in relation to God. For Paul, this creates the possibility of a new multicultural community based on faith alone and is not restricted to a single ethnic or religious background. See, these are very different gospels, different kinds of good news. Now, I happen to think there's a third kind of good news. And I think it's the good news of the cosmic Christ. And it comes from my understanding of creation spirituality. So the cosmic Christ theology is based on the term panentheism. And I think we touched about on this way back in Advent when we did our creation spirituality series. In panentheism, and I broke down the word for you, pan means all, N means in, theism means God, all in God. So if you look now at the, um, the diagram that's there, my artwork leaves a lot to be desired, but I was trying to give you some kind of a sense of a visual. So the red color is me, is, is humans, humans, okay, us. The CC, the gold, that's the cosmic Christ. So what pantheism teaches us, that Christ is in everything and everything is in Christ. So if you look at these two diagrams, the first one, the red is us and the gold inside is the energy of the Christ filling us. And then when we flip it around to the next one, we see the energy all around and we are within it. So both the Christ is in us and we are in the Christ. That's panentheism. And that would be a whole new way of understanding Eucharist. Many years ago, I think 40 or 50 years ago, I was trying to remember, a priest came and gave um, a, a retreat for the convent where I was living. And I will never forget this one sentence that he kept saying. And at that time, I didn't understand why he kept saying this. But now I have a much better understanding. He kept saying, everything is coming up Christ. Everything is coming up Christ. And now understanding panentheism, I get what he's saying. There is nowhere we can go, nothing we can look at, nowhere we can be where Christ isn't. Especially when we understand, according to the words of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit and the Christ lives in each of us. Every time we talk to each other, we are engaging and being engaged by the Christ. So communion is a constant and continuous everywhere in everything. It's a different way to understand communion. So why do we do the Lord's table if we are constantly in communion? Because we forget. And it reminds us, it helps to heighten our awareness. 
and something that Jesus also told us in John's gospel. He said in John 14, remember, I will not leave you orphaned ever. I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. So you see, Jesus keeps reinforcing how the Christ, how we are Christed and everything is. So this distinction, I believe in the traditional words of the institution are theologically sound for our worship experience, shaped by the gospel of Paul, but also by the gospel of Jesus, yes. And the kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus is, is a vision of how the world would be. Now think on this. The kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus is a vision of how the world would be if God, if divine love, if ancient love, the creative force, if the love that continues to bring everything to life in every moment was not a Caesar and not a Herod that sat on the throne. Think about how different everything would be. So this vision of the governing style of God as an antidote to the ancient domination system based too much, like today, on wealth and power and exclusivity and violence. It's a focus on the creation of a just society. When the church is committed to the vision of Jesus, the Eucharist can take on a new meaning. It can be seen as a feast of justice, not a sacrament of sacrificial atonement. You see, the Eucharist, and this is according to the words of a liturgist Gabe Huck, the Eucharist can become a kind of product created for individual spiritual customers. It's supposed to have a transforming effect on us so that when we leave the church, we leave determined to do something, to make a difference. We should be seeing the world in a different way and have different priorities because of the Eucharist. It should affect what we do with our time, how we spend our money, how we look for a job and how we vote, unquote. According to Huck, there's five elements of social justice that can be found in the Eucharistic meal. I'm gonna go through these quickly. The five elements are liberation. In all three gospels, they're linked to the Passover, liberation from oppression, egalitarianism. Jesus sat at table with the beggars and the prostitutes. He sat with everybody. It's a shared meal. In the early days, they would come together and it was an actual feast. It was a great meal. And to make sure that everyone got food and everyone was cared for, they would touch base with one another. That's what they did. And fourth, it's a sample and a foretaste of God's reign of love. Celebrating the Eucharist, anticipating the day when the world will be fed because of our compassionate actions for greater justice. The Eucharistic meal should encourage and empower us to live the vision of God's reign today. That's how we create heaven here. We change how we think. We change how we do. We change how we be. We love, we love, we love, we love like God does. No matter what, no matter the cost. And the, finally, it's a sign of transformation. That this broken body, the term body is both singular and plural. In this community gathered around this meal, we become, as Apostle Paul suggests, a living metaphor for the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And when I did my scriptural research on this, I discovered that there were 22 references of the body of Christ in Paul's epistles. So he says, we are many persons, but in Christ we are one body. And each part of the body belongs to all the other parts. We belong to each other. And then he says, we give thanks for the cup at the Lord's Supper. When we do, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? Now notice he said, we're sharing in the blood of Christ. He doesn't say we're sharing the blood of Christ. He said, we're sharing in the blood of Christ. And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? See, the Eucharistic, Eucharist is an invitation for us to go forth from the meal to break our own bodies, to shed our own blood, to be in service of others. And the communal nature of the meal reminds us that we're not alone in this ongoing struggle for a just society and world. So 
So looking at this way of understanding through Jesus's eyes, I would suggest that the words we use today as we receive this sacrament is the bread of life for all who hunger and the cup of compassion for a broken world. Now we're going to sing the song Sanctuary. It's a beautiful song that will help to prepare our hearts. And then right after that song, we're going to move right into communion. Now I want to give you a heads up. Don't receive until we all receive together so that we can be the community, the body of Christ together. Let us sing Sanctuary. For the power of love in human life and history, we give thanks and praise. Long ago, our ancestors knew love's power, and they became the tellers of love's tale. Love bound them in covenant, teaching them to live in community with compassion and concern for the poorest among them. Yet centuries of domination and violence shaped a different kind of community based in selfishness and inequality. In the struggle against oppression, Jesus became the face of love, showing us the way to abundant life. In word and deed, he announced love's new reign of justice, reconciliation and peace. Filled with the courage and passion of love's spirit, he gave his life to challenge the unjust systems of this world. On the night of his betrayal, and his arrest. As he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. And now break your bread. And he gave it to his followers saying, share this bread, this bread among you. you. This, this is my body, body which, we which will be broken for, for justice. Do this, Do this to remember me. remember me. When supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Share this cup of us on you. On you. This oh, is the blood that will be shed for liberation. Do this to remember me. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us in this bread and wine. And may this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole. 
when we, when we eat, 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 eat the bread, bread drink bread, from this cup, we experience again the presence of Jesus, of Jesus in our midst. In our midst. The table is ready. All are welcome. Come, for the feast is spread. And now we share the bread together as we say, the bread, oh, the bread of life, the bread of life for all who hunger. As we share the cup, let us say together, the, the cup, cup of compassion for a broken world. world. Let us pray the blessing together. May this meal, May this meal nourish us. Us. May it strengthen us and renew us. May it unite us and fill us with the spirit of forever. Amen. Let us continue together. God, God love, love, we give you thanks and satisfying our hungry hearts with this meal. Send us from here to reveal your love to the world. Inspire in us resolve and the courage, the compassion and the passion to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. Amen.
Putting one hand on your heart, extending a heart to each other, to all the world, to all those you care about, to all those you don't know, to all those who need your prayer now. Feel the love and the grace and the blessing of the entire universe of God coming through you. with healing and comfort, calm, contentment, whatever you can think that someone needs, pain-free. Easy passing. protection from harm and whatever else you want to send out there on the universe's divine energy and then turning your hand and bringing it back to your own heart because you too are part of this universe and you receive the blessing of that divine love it cradles you, loving you, appreciating all that you're doing, appreciating all that you're suffering. Feel how you're being held. And when you open your eyes, know that everything is coming up, Christ. Amen.